Hello IP World History students and welcome to Units 3 and 4 review. Uh, this unit we call the Origins of Global Interdependence and it lasts from about 1450 to 1750. Basically we'll be covering information found in chapters 22 to 27 of your Traditions and Encounters text and uh, your notes are also a really good resource. What I'd like to do today is just go over with you some uh, some of the, the more important uh, developments during this time period. Now the College Board does set out to give us some key concepts to guide our instruction and so for this uh, these two units unit three and four we're looking at the interconnection of the western and eastern hemispheres for really the first sustained time in history this is going to have a huge impact on trade on society on culture we're also going to see the expansion of knowledge and scientific learning and technology that comes way back from the classical period preserved by uh, the Islamic world and uh, from the Asian world as well. And so we're gonna see an explosion of technological advancements. We're gonna see the increase of uh, empire and their increased scope and in their influence around the world, as well as the um, incorporations of diverse populations that they incorporated because of this uh, um, connection between the East and West. And then we're also going to see that there are major changes occurring in agriculture, systems and locations of manufacturing, gender and social structures, as well as environmental processes. Really, this unit just it comes down to these four main themes. Now, what I'd like to start with is just a look at um, oceanic exploration. This was such an exciting time in the history of of uh, sailing and I can only imagine for those who are true sailors who loved to be on the ocean that this must have been a really really exciting time for them. Um, so why did oceanic exploration take off? Well first of all the motives were to, to get their hands on basic resources and so um, by being able to go to areas for example the Portuguese who were kind of land poor but lived on the sea, they could access resources uh, by sailing. Land for cultivation of cash crops. So uh, again, we're gonna be looking at where people went uh, and especially the Europeans going to the new world and having land for cash crops like sugar and tobacco. Um, a desire to establish new sea trade routes to Asia. Remember, Europeans, really liked Asian goods, whether it's India or Southeast Asia or China, there are high demand for goods from these regions and they could avoid the tolls paid to Muslim middlemen along the overland Silk Roads. Um, there was a really strong missionary thrust throughout these oceanic explorations and all of the ships that came from Europe had to have a missionary on board. So ultimately, you can summarize the oceanic exploration motives with three words, God, gold, and glory. And which one you put first depends on who you talk to. All right, so new technologies and knowledge. So first of all, the stern post rudder was a rudder that actually went through the boat. It wasn't a rudder that was just uh, controlled from the back of the boat as some of like our small sailboats nowadays have. And so this allowed for much greater control of the boat. We have ships now sailing with a huge number of sails. If you look at the sails from uh, ships from the 16th and 17th century, they have both square sails, which blows wind from behind and uh, can increase the speed. And you have uh, Latin sails. These are triangular and uh, the, the, these uh, sails can catch wind from all different sides and they can be maneuvered very easily. This, the square sails just come down in sheets basically. The triangular side is, uh, sails can be maneuvered. If you ever um, sailed on a, uh, a vessel with both square sails and triangular sails, um, I know that I have. When they put up the triangular sails, it's like boom, all of a sudden we go faster and we can move better. Um, so navigation equipment also um, increases. We have the south pointing compass that came from China. The astrolabe is a uh, device that helps determine latitude. This comes from Persia. Um, and remember, latitude are the lines that uh, are 
and go from the equator up and down. Longitude lines will not be discovered uh, a way to measure that until the 19th century. So other knowledge that we have, and I'm, I have obscured this map a little bit, but uh, two really important developments occur during this time. The discovery of wind wheels in both the northern and southern hemispheres. And uh, this is just that knowledge that the wind moves in a predictable pattern in both northern and some of the southern hemisphere and we're talking about specifically Atlantic Ocean winds at, at, at this point. Also the discovery of ocean currents under the water. So there's an ocean current called the Gulf Stream and it goes up from uh, down through the Gulf of Mexico across North America and over to Europe and it's actually quite warm. Uh, the water is warm and this is why parts of Europe that might even be further north than where we are in Minnesota are warmer because the Gulf, uh, the, the Gulf current um, brings that warmer water and that warmer air. Um, and then also following these currents allows sailors to get to the Americas. Uh, the monsoon winds are something that um, sailors have known about for a long time. These take sailors from the coast of Africa to India and back and uh, they they change seasonally. And then the strategy that was really helpful for getting to uh, Africa initially was called the Volta de Mar um, strategy. So uh, from the Portuguese sailors would sail out from North America, catching uh, the winds and the currents. They would sail way out, sometimes all the way over to South America without knowing that it was there. And they would end up on the west coast of Africa. So these were important um, technologies and knowledge that helps sailors during this time period in history. So I'm just going to briefly mention some famous explorers. You know, the, the, what you really need this information for is to provide outside evidence. So if if you do get a question that has to do with explorers, here are some important ones. Um, Diaz rounded the Cape of Good Hope uh, somewhere between 1486 and 1488, and then he stopped. He did not want to go any farther than that. This is actually very, very rough water uh, on, the, on the Cape of Good Hope. Um, I don't know what his exact motivation was for stopping, but I do know that he did not want to go across the Indian Ocean. Vasco da Gama did end up sailing to India, so he sailed all the way from Portugal um, to India in 1497 to 1498. Now Columbus will talk about in a little bit, um, uh, because he's kind of on his own, um, but he sailed from Spain to the Caribbean in 1492, not really knowing that it was the Caribbean, of course. He didn't really know that he had, quote, discovered a whole new uh, continental region. But um, nevertheless, uh, that was a, a really, really marker event in history. Magellan, uh, Ferdinand Magellan, was very ambitious. He started with over 200 people on his voyage around the globe. He died in the Philippines on a fight, and I believe only 20-some people um, actually made it back uh, from that voyage. And then James Cook, um, he traveled through the Pacific. He did, um, I believe, three different voyages, mapped much of the Pacific and the islands of the Pacific, actually died in Hawaii in, in a altercation with the natives of Hawaii. Um, so during this time, trading post empires occurred all throughout Asia, uh, India, and um, so a few famous ones, some that you might want to take note of, are the Portuguese, first of all. So Alfonso de Albuquerque sought to control the Indian Ocean, Indian Ocean through safe conduct passes. The Portuguese had several uh, ships that uh, basically followed the shipping lanes. There are actually shipping lanes, places because of the monsoon winds and the currents, there are shipping lanes where ships typically pass. And so Albuquerque would uh, stop ships and uh, require a fee of them so that uh, they would be safe and, um, in other words, not get taken over by the Portuguese. Uh, the English and and Dutch, they started uh, joint stock ventures. These are ventures where people, let's say a hundred different investors will invest in a particular ship to sail to either India or to sail to Indonesia or to sail to China. And if a ship would sink, and there are several hundreds of ships that sunk during this time period, um, 
of a ship sunk because it's a joint stock venture, you reduce your risk. And these joint stock ventures had really broad powers. They could declare war, they could um, commandeer other ships. And the two most notable English and Dutch companies were the EEIC, the English East India Company, and they developed Emporia, a, a trading post, especially along Indian coastal regions. And the Dutch, they found their way to Southern Africa and actually will take over Southern Africa for a period of time and uh, colonize it, as well as Indonesia. And their company was called the VOC. The Spanish, they get themselves into the Philippines and um, they create a hub in Manila of Spanish trade in Asia. So China's really like kind of, they, they're not doing a lot of direct trade. They have only a few ports. So many ships will come into Manila, many of them carrying gold, uh, silver from the Spanish colonies in the Americas, and they can carry really large loads of um of both silver and of products. And so uh, the Spanish had a great deal of influence as a hub in Asia. Now, eventually all of these uh, people competing for power in the region, uh, this will lead to the Seven Years' War. In the Americas, in American history, you learn about this as the French and Indian War, but this is actually considered by many to be the First World War because it was fought on many fronts from 1756 to 1763, which as if you do your math right, is seven years, um, the British will actually end up gaining the upper hand in this and uh, British will gain hegemony, which means that they will have the greatest economic and political power among these seafaring nations. All right, let's talk about the Colombian exchange. This has got to be one of the hugest markers uh, events in the history of global interaction. Um, you know, 1492 is really a, an important date. You know, when I was a kid, we had the song 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Now, regardless of what you think of Christopher Columbus as a human being, as a sailor, the way he treated uh, the people in the lands that um, he went to, what happened after Christopher Columbus sailed is that um, this led to sustained contact between the Americas and Afro-Eurasia. So this is a huge marker event. Um, when you think of the Columbian Exchange, think of these three letters, PAD, plants, animals, diseases, plants, maize, corn, and potatoes. These grow in the Americas and they head over to Afro-Eurasia and increase the caloric intake of people in Afro-Eurasia. The West, think of this, North America, we have so many wheat fields in North America. There was no wheat in North or South America before the Columbian Exchange. Animals, finally draft animals like, like, um, uh, cows and horses, uh, they come to America, the Americas for the first time. Now there had to have been some large animals, but they hadn't been domesticated except for if you count like, I don't know, llamas. Um, also a huge migration of people. People are animals too, and much of it was forced. Um, some was voluntary to the Americas. We'll talk about the Atlantic slave trade in the next episode. Um, and then of course diseases, um, epidemics like smallpox came to the America. It decimated, decimated the indigenous population of the Americas because they had absolutely no immunity. This is something like the coronavirus is in uh, our current day pandemic. However, smallpox was much more deadly, had a much higher fatality rate than the coronavirus does. Interesting, syphilis was something that went to Europe. And the thing about syphilis is, it causes insanity. It causes people to go to crazy. Mozart's believe it's believed um, suffered from syphilis, and this is what caused some of the. Uh, um, well, he was he just got kind of crazy, and he was an alcoholic. Uh, but other than that, some overall effects: population growth because of more diverse diet around the globe. Uh, as I said, decline of American indigenous population populations due to smallpox and a massive exploitation of natural resources. And we will talk about what those are both today and in the next review session, uh, because the entire world, of course, is full of resources. Thank you for listening to episode one.